Hey everyone, welcome to another installment of Harry Potter Theory. Today we're going to be discussing anime guy. Witches and wizards with the unique ability to transform into an animal and back again at will. A single witch or wizard who possesses this ability is known as an animagus. The practice of becoming an animagus and transforming your body in this way is considered to be a specialized form of transfiguration, a branch of magic focused on changing the form and appearance of objects, creatures, and people. Transfiguration encompasses a wide range of magical spells and techniques, from simple object transformations to more complex human transfiguration. Animagus is a combination of the word animal and the Greek word magus, meaning animal wizard. Once a witch or wizard masters the ability to become an animagus, they will adopt an animal form that is closely linked to their personality and inner traits. One very important thing to note is that your animagus form is not something you can choose. It's entirely out of your control and is left entirely up to fate. Whatever you are destined to be is what you're stuck with. Sometimes this works against you, like Peter Pettigrew, who transforms into a rat, and sometimes it works in your favor, like James Potter transforming into a stag. It's also worth mentioning that there is a distinct relationship between your animagus form and your patronus form. If you know what your spirit animal is, then it's likely that you'll have insight into what your animagus would be if you took the time to master the ability. There don't seem to be many limitations with regards to what an animagus can actually be, as we've seen witches and wizards transform into both regular and magical creatures. If the correlation between Patronus animals and Animagus forms is as concrete as we suspect, then we can logically deduce that it is possible for the Animagus form of witches and wizards to resemble even the mightiest of creatures, like dragons, chimeras, thestrals, and phoenixes. In the books, however, we're only introduced to a handful of more common animals like dogs, cats, rats, etc. This brings me to the short list of known Animagi in the series. James Potter was the father of Harry Potter and achieved the feat of becoming an Animagus at the age of 15. His Animagus form matched his corporeal Patronus form, which was a tall and powerful red stag. Sirius Black was the godfather of Harry Potter. Like James, Sirius also accomplished this feat at the age of 15, his Animagus form resembling a large black dog. Peter Pettigrew, with the help of his fellow marauders, was also able to become an Animagus. Pettigrew's Animagus form was a rat, which eventually earned him the nickname of Wormtail. Rita Skeeter was a journalist in which with a bit of a dubious reputation for being dishonest in her journalistic endeavors. Skeeter used her unassuming and unregistered animagus form of a blue beetle to get dirt on whatever it was that she was writing about. Minerva McGonagall, Transfiguration Master, had the ability to transform into a silver tabby cat. She was known to use this ability when she didn't want to be seen or recognized. Talbot Winger, a Hogwarts student from the 1980s, was said to have been able to transform into an eagle. His mother, whose name we don't know, was able to turn into a swan. And as far as known animagi are concerned, that's about it. In the above list, you may have noticed me throwing around the terms registered and unregistered. What I'm referring to here is whether or not these witches and wizards have registered their animagus status with the Ministry of Magic. Let me explain. If you are able to successfully transform into any kind of animagus form, wizarding law dictates that you must register this ability with the ministry. The following quote explains this. We did animagi in class with Professor McGonagall, and I looked them up when I did my homework. The Ministry of Magic keeps tabs on witches and wizards who can become animals. There's a register showing what animal they become, and their markings and things. And I went and looked Professor McGonagall up on the register, and there have only been seven animagi this century. Once you've achieved this massive accomplishment, the registration is processed by an employee at the Improper Use of Magic Office in the Ministry of Magic. It's not a certification proving that you have the skill, but merely adding your specific info to the ministry list so they can keep tabs on you if needed. If your animagus status is unknown, it gives you a little bit too much flexibility to just drop off the face of the earth, as we saw with Peter Pettigrew. But perhaps the most surprising aspect of the above passage is that, according to Hermione's research, there are only seven known animagi from the last century. What I want to discuss further is why? How is it that this powerful ability is so underutilized in wizarding society? 
Why haven't powerful wizards like Voldemort and Dumbledore attempted it? Let's dive in. Misreporting The first and simplest answer to this question is that there are many more animagi in the wizarding world than we are led to believe. I'd bet money that there are dozens of witches and wizards out there who achieved this impressive feat and have simply decided not to register themselves with the Ministry of Magic. The primary function of the registration system was to ensure that animagi did not abuse their abilities, but I imagine that existing as a non-registered animagus would undoubtedly come with many advantages that most witches and wizards wouldn't be so quick to relinquish. But can you blame them? I feel like most of the advantages gained from becoming an animagus go straight out the window upon registration. The complex process. The next answer to this question is that for some, the drawn out, intricate and precarious process involved with becoming an animagus simply may not be worth pursuing. The extensive process involved with becoming an animagus has been outlined on Pottermore. Step one, do your homework. In transfiguration and potions at least, becoming an animagus requires a witch or wizard to be skilled in both these areas in order to stand a chance of achieving such a complex transformation. Step two, carry a single mandrake leaf in your mouth for an entire month. From full moon to full moon, to be precise, yes, we're serious. If you swallow the leaf or remove it from your mouth at any point, you have to start the whole thing again. No one likes to see that happen. You then have to find a small crystal file that receives the pure rays of the moon. Put your saliva-filled leaf inside and add one of your own hairs. Step three, add a silver teaspoon of dew from a place that neither sunlight nor human feet have touched for a full seven days. And if that wasn't hard enough, you then have to add the chrysalis of a death's head hawk moth to the crystal file as well. Then put this mixture in a quiet, dark place and leave it alone until the next electrical storm. And really leave it alone. Don't even look at it. Don't even think about looking at it. Step four, while waiting for the storm, you must place your wand tip over your heart every sunrise and sundown and speak the following incantation. Amato, animo, and amato, and amagus. If you keep repeating your incantation, there will come a time when, with the touch of the one tip to the chest, a second heartbeat may be sensed. Don't change anything, keep going, keep waiting for that storm. Step five, as soon as lighting appears in the sky, go to the place where you've hidden your crystal file. At last, if you've done everything right, then you will discover a mouthful of blood red potion inside it. Then move somewhere where you aren't going to alarm anyone or place yourself in physical danger during your transformation. An Animagus transformation party is definitely a bad idea. Step six, place your wand tip against your heart and speak the incantation, Amato, Animo, Animato, Animagus, and drink the potion. You will then feel fiery pain, lucky you, and an intense double heartbeat. Step seven, the shape of the creature into which you will shortly transform will appear in your mind. The instructions then warn, you must show no fear. It is too late now to escape the change you have willed. Yikes. Step eight, when your transformation is complete, you are strongly advised to pick up your wand and hide it somewhere safe, so you can find it post-transformation. To return to human form, visualize your human self as clearly as you can. Don't worry if you don't change back immediately, with practice, you'll be able to slip in and out of your animal form at will, simply by visualizing the creature. Once you're an advanced animagus, you should be able to transform without your wand. And if these extremely particular and time-consuming instructions still weren't enough to put you off the process, then surely the next point will. It's dangerous. Becoming an animagus involves significant risks. If the process is not executed correctly, the consequences can be disastrous. This is also outlined on Pottermore. When the process of becoming an animagus goes wrong, it often goes seriously wrong. We're talking horrible half-human, half-animal mutations here, with no known cure. The first transformation is usually uncomfortable and frightening. Clothing and items such as glasses or jewelry meld the skin and become one with fur, scales, or spikes. When you first transform, Try to avoid panicking, otherwise the animal mind may gain the ascendancy, and you could do something stupid or dangerous. Difficulty. The final reason that becoming an animagus isn't for everyone simply boils down to the fact that it's very difficult. Not only do you need the mental fortitude to look past all of the aforementioned complications, you also need to be extremely talented in the field of transfiguration. While transfiguration is a core subject taught at Hogwarts, 
The ability to become an Animagus is a rare and advanced skill that few witches and wizards are capable of achieving. Animagi transformations demonstrate the incredible potential of transfiguration magic, and the mastery required to achieve such a feat is a testament to the magical prowess of those who are able to do so. In summary, the apparent shortage of witches and wizards capable of becoming Animagi is a direct result of the complexity, risk and commitment involved in the process of becoming one. However, I also believe that we should be taking the ministry figures for Animagi with a grain of salt. Though rare and complicated, I don't think it's nearly as rare as what we're led to believe. More than likely, there are copious powerful wizards out there like, uh, I don't know, Voldemort and Dumbledore for example, that have mastered the ability but have simply never chosen to reveal it. And that's it for this video. What do you think? Did this question ever occur to you? Leave a comment down below. Also, if you enjoy the content, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, remember, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live.